corporate strategy. Last time I saw you guys, we spoke about your assignment. And in your assignment, there were two um, environments that you needed to analyze. The one was your external environment, which we've done the past two weeks. And now I'm in Washington, D.C., and you are on Howard campus. So I'm making this video for you so you can learn more about the internal environment of an organization and what we can do to analyze it. So when we looked at the external environment, there were two big things that came up. We said there's your SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And to recap from last week, um, your strength and weaknesses got to do with your internal environment. And I will discuss that now. And from last week, opportunities and threats got to do with your external environment. So we're taking the scope now towards the organization and I want yourself to still imagine. Imagine yourself in the workplace and think that you are busy with corporate strategy, you are a, a manager and your job is the corporate strategist. Now in this business that you imagine where you are the corporate strategist, let's look how we are going to analyze the internal environment. Now again, what is the reason why we want to analyze any kind of environment? Because we don't have a glass ball. We don't know how to make predictions on the future. So somehow we're trying just to find out more information that can help us to make better predictions or better decisions when crafting and implementing our strategy that can perhaps increase the profit of our business. Let's move forward. The slides are available on Moodle. You just need to go to learn, log in, it's there, chapter seven as well. Read this chapter in conjunction with your assignment. So this chapter emphasized the importance of understanding the environment, not only external opportunities and threats, but also the internal strengths and weaknesses. I want you to pay specific notice to the terminology RBV, resource-based view. And as I said to you guys before, that resources are a big thing. It's not necessarily human resources. Resources can include any tangible thing that can help you to your business to be more productive. Now, again, and this I said a few times, there are various models that you can use to analyze your environments. The PESEL model we used for your external environment and the SWAT we're going to use for your internal environment um, where we will look at your strengths and weaknesses. Remember, you will need to apply this theory to your assignment. Your assignment is on Joe's genes. So again, what we learn here, make a note of it, of how you're going to use it twofold. First, for your assignment. And second, when you are in the world of work, how is this going to help you to do your job better? I'm skipping through those introduction. You guys can read through it yourself. It is up there. Um, it's just a bit of a history of the development of a resource-based view. It's in your book. It's on Moodle. Um, I don't feel it necessary to go in this video through uh, the history. Now, the acceptance of the resource-based view left, uh, rests on three important pillars. The first one is strategic direction. The next one is primary source um, of the industry competitiveness, the attractiveness of the, the industry competitiveness, and then your industry positioning. Now, what we've done before on your vision and mission, or aim and objectives, and all the goals that flows throughout that, and remember we said that from these goals, 
There's certain action plans, and action plans means nothing if you don't implement it. That is the strategic direction. Now, through all this analysis, all these questions that you ask, and looking at the internal environment, and looking at the external environment, you will check what industry might be good for you to do business in, the attractiveness of the industry, and then your competitive advantage. So what do you have that is cooler than those of your competitors? What do you have that's unique? What is your unique selling point? That thing that can make you better. For example, that when you manufacture pharmaceuticals or skin lotions or makeup, you don't harm animals in the process. Or if you're selling meat products, you say it's, uh, let's say chickens. The chickens are um, free-ranging chickens. They're all grain-fed. Um, and your business got this competitive advantage, this unique thing where other, uh, other competitors perhaps um, grow chickens inside on not that a humane way. And then your industry position, positioning is how do you want not only your customers, but your competitors, the people that you do business with, your network, going to perceive you, so your psychological positioning, and then also your physical positioning. Where are you going to position yourself within the market? Um, again, a newcomer, somebody that's been there already for a while, somebody that's been established. Um, various authors use term economic rent and rent interchangeably. There are three types of economic rents commonly mentioned in the strategy literature. Ricardian rents, monopoly rents, and Champerian rents. Ricardian rents are those rents associated with unique resources and capabilities. Monopoly trends are associated with unique position in the marketing place, for example, ESCOM. And Schumpeten rents um, refer to those returns approach by the organization because of new or innovative products that allows its temporary change a price high above cost of production. I told you guys before that I lived in the Middle East for a long time. I lived in Abu Dhabi. And I can remember in the days of living in Abu Dhabi, we would have had access to a variety of new technologies. We would have had an iPhone before it's released in other countries. We would have had Samsung TVs before it's released in some price else. But it was expensive and we pay. We pay for that stigmatism to have the new and the innovativeness. So I think that can be classified as unbeaten rent. Monopoly, uh, monopoly rents, my opinion, it is not healthy. It's when there's no competitors. So in South Africa, ESCOM, when we've got that power failure and the power is not going on and we need to get things going and accept of having our own generators, who else can help? For a long time, we only had Telcom as our only telecom provider. But as time goes by, other competitors enter the market and now, if you're not happy with Telcom's price, you can go over to, um, to somebody else. I still think, um, for example, where I lived in Abu Dhabi, they only had one provider for telecom, one provider for uh, water and electricity, and it made things really tricky, especially when it comes to determining of price. The strategic importance of resources and capabilities now, in short, the value of resources um, is determined by the extent to which the resources are available source of competitive advantage, the extent to which such a competitive advantage is sustainable over time, the extent to which the organization is in a position to appropriate the returns generated by the resources and the extent to which resources can be exploited in the future. Now, if I take those few words from the previous slide 
and just need to take out the keys. Your competitive advantage, appropriateability, sustainability, and exploitability. Now, what make your resources valuable? You need to think that the things that you have in your organization, what do you have that can give you a competitive advantage? Um, do you have certain type of technology that other people don't have? And that technology, is it appropriate to what your business do? You've got technology that is for a specific manufacturing process. Is that appropriate to your supply chain? And then this technology that you got or this machinery that you have, can it sustain? Can it make X amount of products? How long does it need to last before you need to replace it? And exploiting uh, exploitability, um, can other people copy the technology? Concentrating your resources, con uh, conserving your resources. Do you need to have a lot of equipment? Do you need to have a lot of technology? Um, but basically, the things that, that you have, how can you make your resources valuable to your organization that people can use it in order that you can implement your strategy in order that you can reach your organizational aim and objectives in order that you can make that increased profit that you want now let's take a closer look at competitive advantage if a resource meets customer needs at a price that the customers are willing to pay there is demand for it. However, resources is more valuable um, if it can establish a competitive advantage. This means that the resource can meet the customer needs better than the competition. Thus, the concept of distinct capability and the role is creating competitive advantage becomes more important in understanding the value of resources. Guys, what this all means is what can you offer your clients which your competitors can't and in what way can you give it to them that is cooler and better that you, your competitors can and when you offer this uniqueness this great service or great product that your competitors can't do it how can you upkeep it that your customers keep on coming back to you because you've got this something really cool there's something really unique which others don't when you plan your organization, you really need to put in a lot of thought into that thing, that competitive advantage, that uniqueness. Now, ha, see, there it comes on the next slide. There are four determinants of scarcity of resources, your physical uniqueness, your path dependency, your casual ambiguity, and your economic uh, deterrence. Now, let's go a little bit more into this. I just spoke about your physical uniqueness. So, the slide is giving an example of real estates. Location, location, location. Kind of patents that you've got, perhaps some rights that you've got, perhaps some intellectual property. Those things that makes it physically unique, tangible uniqueness. Path dependency. A second source of scarcity is the path dependency. Certain resources can only build over time in ways that it cannot be replicated. Brand image, organizational culture, a company's reputation, examples of resources that cannot be replicated. I have been to the coolest conference last year where one of the presenters spoke about family businesses and family owned enterprises. And um, at the conference, they spoke about the uniqueness of family owned enterprises and the long-lasting trust that some family businesses build up over decades and people keep on going back because of the path dependency they trust this business they trust this family business they know it's good quality and they keep on coming back casual ambiguity in many instances it might be difficult even impossible for competitors to work out exactly um, what the truly valuable resource of arrival is and how to duplicate it. Yo. 
never underestimate your competitors. And I want to slightly differ from what this is saying in the slide. <laughs> Always imagine, be, be prepared. With technology that we've got these days and with imaginations that we've got of, of competitors, it's easy to duplicate. It's easy to replicate. Um, don't ever become too casual and think, I've got something unique. People cannot replicate it. Um, you can just look in China, Japan, Taiwan. Copyright, IP, you register something in one way, easily people will go in the same patent, they just change something small and bring out a new piece of technology. Last one, economic deterrence. Is that how I pronounce it? I hope so. Occurs when economic realities make it unattractive for rivals to invest in certain resources. Um, when economic realities make it unattractive for rivals to invest in certain resources. Let me just give an example here. Um, let's say we live in Cape Town right now. Would it be a smart move if you go and you invest in a company that is um, producing swimming pool, uh, swimming pool stuff, anything for a swimming pool? or lawns, something that needs a lot of water. We know that water is a scarcity at the moment, but um, if, if you go and you invest into something where, which, doesn't, which doesn't help, it might not be a smart move for your business. Well, I need to let you guys in on something. I'm currently sitting on this chair and I hope I'm still looking at you, but this chair is giving me dead legs of note. So I'm trying to sit again, but if you see me move once in a while, <laughs> it's because I'm trying to feel my legs here. Right, the next thing, sustainability. Sustainability is one of the most important things of your business. The one thing is to get it going, but then to keep it up. You know that thing that you call a New Year's resolution and we start off with something and say, New Year, new me, off we go to the gym, let's get it going, we get our juice, we get our healthy food and then we come to March and you're like, boh, you know, there's a whole lot of months less and I'm not in the mood for it and you just give up. One of the most difficult things for organizations is the upkeep of a trend that you set. Let's say you start up your organization and you've got high standards. You answer the phone in a certain way, you deliver your product in a certain amount of time, you treat your customers in a certain, a certain manner at a high level. You cannot drop that expectations. If people come and expect a certain kind of service quality, service delivery, certain type of products from you, you will need to upkeep it and build on it and continuously improve on it. And just to be completely honest, and my, not, not that I'm saying I'm, I'm old, but in my almost 20 years of work experience, I can tell you guys it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy to keep it up, to keep it going, not to give in, just to sustain. Now, the author of the book is saying there are four barriers to transferability that will make it difficult for competitors to successfully transfer resource, resources for their own benefit. First one, geographical immobility. Second one, imperfect information. Third, resource um, complementary, complementary, and the fourth, resource dependency. Now, geographical immobility, resources may be geographic, uh, geographically immobile, for example, mineral deposits. <sighs> yeah, I, I read what the slide is saying, and I hear what the author is saying, 
But um, I think with what we have these days available to us, it is very difficult to, to think of the word immobile. I, would, my, I might interpret it as geographically very expensive <laughs> mobile. So you can move the mineral deposits. It might just be really expensive and not cost effective. It's, it, it might be possible. Next one, imperfect information. Um, how do they make that amazing tasting KFC drumstick? Why can't Pepsi ever get that perfect Coca-Cola taste? Why can't we recreate a, a hamburger patty like McDonald's is doing? What is that secret ingredient? We do not, we do not, we do not know at all. So competitors do not have all the information to recreate or duplicate your IP. Resources complementary. Separating a resource such as a brand from its context can cause a, a loss in value. Thus, resources may be dependent on the context. Complementary resources will then be less productive in a different setting. Um, let's say we take Nivea Men skin cream. Because it's Nivea, it's cool. Because it's a skin cream for men, it's cool because it's Nivea. But if you take the brand out and just call it rich moisturizing scream for men, do you think it might have the same impact? Resource dependency. This also plays a key role since capabilities are combinations of resources that works together. Separating one aspect, for example, from a team of people from the whole may reduce its efficiency. Appropriateability. The third determinant is a value of resources centers on the question of uh, who captures the value generated by resources. The concept refers to appropriability and explains why internally developed resources are um, generally more valuable than resources uh, bought or used under license. In a previous lesson, I explained to you that these days on the internet, we can find a lot of information. We can find information on how to make our business plans. We can find business plan outlines. We can just fill these things in. But if we take content from the internet, it might not be applicable or appropriate to your organization. Sometimes you need to take what is there and redesign it so it fits for your organization. Remember the previous chapters, we had all those strategic questions. And I said, when you do your environmental analysis, usually take those questions and answer it. But I also say to you that those strategic questions are just questions from the book. When you work in your company and when you work on your assignment, you will need to tweak it that it's appropriate to your context. The more embedded the resources are in the organization, the greater the ability of the organization to appropriate the value flowing of those resources. There are four aspects that determine the potential of the organization and can capture the rent generated by its resources. Protection of IP, intellectual capital. Who's thought out that bright idea? And when you've got that cool idea, Who's protecting it? Relative bargaining power. This can play a role when individual members of an organization have high bargaining power that they then appropriate more for the rent. Embeddedness. In some instances, uh, the individual competencies of a team member may be so embedded in the organization processes that they reduce bargaining power of the individual. In other words, the organization is in a position to appropriate more of the value than individual um, employees. And lastly, resources exploitation. And also important when considering this aspect is the issue of resource exploitation. Some organizations are better at leveraging resources and this enable them to capture more of the, the value generated. All right, going into the last one of exploitability, concentrating resources, 
accumulating your resources, complementing resources, conserving your, your resources. So concentrating your, your resources, converting the resources that, that you've got um, and merge it with your strategic goals, focusing your efforts, targeting how you can get the highest impact, accumulating your resources, um, mine experiences and borrowing from, uh, from other organizations. Let's say you want to do a, a marketing campaign. Sometimes you don't have the funds to produce all um, your own marketing campaign, but you can have a certain of your supply chain within you and they can, um, they can add information to your marketing campaign, they can buy advertising space, they can be part of your campa uh, campaign, therefore you guys are kind of accumulating or working together to make your advertising marketing campaign easier. Complementing resources, blending by linking capabilities, balancing. Guys, these days the silo approach is not the way forward. What you have, how can you make things blend? How can you make things work together? How can you maximize um, your output with the minimum input that you have? Conserving your resources, recycling, opting through, through, through collaboration. You often see uh, organizations getting really creative, for example, with their cans and glass bottles and how they can use the cans and glass bottles for something completely different. Your, your glass bottle that was originally for your Coca-Cola or for your soda is now being used as a lampshade or as a mosaic tile. Developing your resources and capabilities certain ways how we can do it, acquisition, internal creation, creation of separate spin out, um, or spin out the organization. So acquisition, you get it from a different organization. Internal creation speak for itself. You create your own content. I really like that because then you can tweak it for your own organization. And then creation of separate spin out organization capabilities can also be created through a spin out organization where a separate small startup organization is established as a mechanism for developing the required resources and capabilities. Let's, uh, let me give an example there. You've got an organization that manufacture cars. Cars need seats. Your key product is cars. You create a different business that focus on the manufacturing of seats. They produce the seats for the car organization and you work together. Using resources and capabilities to develop competitive advantage. Um, Marvel and, Ca uh, and Case Apple, uh, it's yeah, this is just an example of um, Marvel is uh, children toys and it's also comic characters and Apple, you all know, I. Unique resources, dynamic capabilities, resource replication using hidden resources. Identification of resource capabilities. So how do you identify your resources, your physical resources, intangible resources, human resources, these things that you can use. Assets, I, I, I can also call it assets. Identifying capabilities, types of capabilities, threshold capabilities, distinct capabilities, dynamic capabilities. And there's a variety of analysis you can do to identify these capabilities. Functional analysis, value chain analysis, architectural analysis, um, knowledge and capabilities analysis. Guys, why are we identifying all these resources and capabilities and why are we doing all these analysis? Because we want to see what we have and how can we use what we have to the best of our abilities without spending too much money to implement our corporate strategic plan. Now, to take the previous slides and just put it in a tabulated format, here's a summary of your resource base view. 
um, some tips for testing exams. We like to ask these kind of pictures and tables. Just saying. Function analysis as a framework for identifying distinct capabilities. Each organization has certain principal functional areas according to which it operates. Typical functional areas that can be used in such analysis includes corporate management, resource and development, human resources, finance, marketing, customer care, sales, production, operation, logistics of supply chain management. And weird, doesn't that look like an organigram or a chart of your organization? These words, your functional areas, that can actually be drawn into your chart to say, but these are the different departments of your organization. Making this practical, you've got your assignment that you need to do. And I say to each of you that you must allocate each of your team members a role. You can even in Joe's genes say, but um, person A is the corporate manager. Person B is the financial manager. Person C is the sales manager. You're welcome to divide your teams up in these areas. Examples and analysis of capabilities. Um, I need you guys to go and read through this. The functional areas of the previous slide is put into this table and there's just examples of different South African organizations. Um, Bitwes, Checkers, uh, South African breweries, etc. Now, identifying the value chain as a framework of identifying capabilities. <sighs> Your value chain. That is one of the most important things for your corporate development. And you are busy with your corporate strategic development. You need to know what your value chain is, who in your value chain is, before you even start with your strategic plan. The value chain. So support activities, primary activities, um, go and look at your infrastructure, your technology, your HR, your procurement, um, go and look at your inbound log logistics, your outbound, marketing and sales, operation, after services. But who are involved with what? When I had my businesses um, that, that I told you guys about, um, I had a little spreadsheet with, with each of these, and it would say, let's say operations. And I had a name of a person, the surname of the person, the email address of the person, and the phone num number of the person. And if those things were related to uh, people outside my organization, I made a plan to schedule meetings with each of them and just meet with them and discuss and communicate our corporate strategy and where the organization wants to go to. But to build that value chain was extremely important of taking your corporate strategy further. So this, this slide is the previous one, just a bit more expanded with a bit more examples. Go and have a look at it, read at it. It's all, I mean, obviously it's in your book. This is an example of South African breweries and how they use their value chain. Architecture, reputation, and innovation. Who designs a house? No, not you. The architect designs the house, and they build up these drawings, these complicated pictures, this framework of how the house must be built. And that's the same with, with your corporate strategy and with your corporate. There's an architecture. It's a world of a network of relationships um, and contracts, both inside and outside your, your organization, that add to the value chain of your business. Then, the ability to enhance your reputation. Nobody wants to buy for, from a sucky company or an organization that got a bad reputation or an organization that nobody believes in. You want to maximize the, the positive image the positive reputation of your business, and then innovation. Again, it comes back to your unique selling points and those things that you've got that's unique. 
How do you innovate? What do you do that's different? Knowledge and capabilities. Now, indiv individual knowledge, routines, rules and directive, task sequencing, group problems, solving the, uh, the strategic decision making, etc. Let me just give you guys an example on this one. So, my mate um, Hayden Smith, that I met in Dubai, com avid athlete, he spent most of his time training for triathlons. And in Dubai, he worked in real estate. But he made a decision that he wa not want to live in the Middle East anymore. He got married, wifey got pregnant with their first baby, and he wanted to recreate a, a life for him where he comes from, which is the Gold Coast in Australia. And he thought, well, let me go the franchise route. He wants to open a McDonald's, a Mackey D. Now, that was quite a thing for Aiden that's known as a world-class athlete, and somebody that's actually coming from, from the Middle East and never been in, in fast foods before. Hayden needed to build up a knowledge of McDonald's in and outside before they even thought of selling him the franchise rights. Hayden needed to know how to make the patties, how to do the setup, how to do the orders, how to pound the till how to cut the onions, how to cut the tomatoes, how thick the tomato should be, how you wash it, in what temperature of water do you wash it, how to do the fries. Cutting tomatoes and running a franchise, how is it anyhow related? When you are involved in such a leadership position or as a corporate strategist, you need to know every aspect, every process, every procedure, every routine, all the policies, inside out. To take the business forward, you need to know every aspect. That's why they train Hayden from scratch. And now, what I see of his McDonald's, it looks like it's pumping, and it looks like they're extremely successful. And just by the way, a few weeks ago, Hayden and his wife had their second baby and they all look like they're still healthy, not fell under franchising and that the business is sustained. Remember what I said a few minutes ago of remembering graphs and charts? We like to ask it in the tests and exams. This is one of it. Important. Um, key success factors. Internal analysis to industry key success factors, um, your K, KSF, you can see that in literature all over strategic management. One of those key success things that you need to apply, not right, apply, implement, that can take your organization forward. The fit, your factors, your current re reality, your required resource and capabilities, um, do you need to develop something or are you going to exploit what you have? Some views of strategy, the nature of dynamic capabilities, some theory that we need to know, dynamic capabilities describe an organization's ability to integrate, build and reconfigure internal and external competencies to address rapidly changing environments. This definition rests on two principles, distinctive capabilities and the vitality of the environment. Now, just looking at the next part, for your exams and tests, you are in your third year at the moment. I am not going to ask you, give a definition of dynamic strategies or to, uh, for, for three marks, tell what uh, Gemawat suggested. In your test and your exams, you guys will need to apply this knowledge to the certain essay type of questions and the certain cases that you're going to have. So it's not going to help you to memorize this as a parrot. You need to understand this and then go one step further in your third year to apply it. Dynamic view of strategy, your current resource positions, your lumpy commitments, 
and then the activities that you want to do. Two potential outcomes of dynamic strategy, lock in and lock out. Lock in because of the size of investment, it's not feasible to withdraw from the decision. Lock out the window of opportunity is missed. It may, uh, it may mean that the organization is effectively locked out. Lock in and lock out. Just think of the case study of Joe's genes that you need to use for your assignment. Remember when Joe's genes in the case study is speaking of the different uh, or the multicolored genes and that the markets are changing from not wanting multicolored genes to um, single color genes. And now they want to use different kinds of material and there's certain equipment in the organization that's not working and they needed to cancel an order. Perhaps you want to bring views or, or points of your dynamic view of strategy into your assignment. Perhaps you can put into your assignment these things of potential outcomes of dynamic strategy, the lock in and lock out view, and compare that to the multicolored genes and the stonewash genes um, that they currently want to manufacture. Just a suggestion, you don't need to use new assignment, but it actually fits well in because you're busy with the internal environment and with your SWOT analysis. Identifying strengths and weaknesses. Yo, we went through this chapter and here it is finally. <laughs> Your value chain analysis. Users of value chain analysis determining relative importance of each activity, identifying the cost drivers, understanding influences, um, identifying activities that candidates uh, can use for outsourcing. When we did the previous chapters, there were strategic questions that you can use to determine this. So when writing it up or when you compile your um, corporate strategy, I prefer using a set of questions and then answering it because then I'm tailoring my corporate strategy for the specific business that I'm analyzing instead of just writing these key points that's, uh, that's on the current slide or the current page in your book. The process of using value chain for cost and differentiation analysis for the purpose can, um, of identifying strengths and weaknesses can be outlined as follows. And it's quite important that you guys know the different steps. So you need to know the step one, two, three, four, and five, and how can you apply it? Step one. Identify the component activities of the value chain, in other words, the primary and support activities that makes up the value chain. Step two, establish the cost of each activity. Three, compare the cost and differenti differentiation of drivers per activity. Four, identify cost and differentiation drivers, in other words, those things that have the most impact on cost or the activity on the perception. Five, identify opportunities for reducing cost of improving quality. If I think of my work the past 20 years, working either for my own businesses, working for government, working in corporate, working in education, I have never, ever, ever been in a situation over all this time that says, this budget look amazing. We have money to do everything. You will always hear, we need to cut costs. And that is, when you compile your strategy and when you write your strategy, costs. We can all be creative. We can all dream a lot. And cost, not necessarily only money, but time. Time can also be costly. Would you be able to afford that, to implement your opportunities that you identified? Um, this table is also important, a lot of information on it. It's just a great summary of what has just been explained to you um, all on one page. So if you study, this slide may make your studying a bit easier.
Benchmarking. We told you guys about this benchmarking. We did discuss this and we say, check against your competitor, check against the market, check where you stand, where you float. Different types of benchmarking, historical benchmarking, industry benchmarking, based in the class benchmarking. Now, these are defined as follows. Historical benchmarking occurs when organizations compare their performance to their own performance of the previous year. But let's say you don't have a previous year. You don't have a history to compare for. Then you can compare yourself against the industry and what's happening with similar organizations within your industry. And then best in class may be used to see comparisons more widely than just the industry. So um, let's say you are in the hospitality industry and you benchmark yourself and you did an industry benchmarking in the hospitality industry. Maybe you want to benchmark yourself also in the tourism and travel industry. A practical framework for the appraisal of resources and capabilities. Always when you got your strategy and you implement your strategy, that appraisal of resources means you need to go and check. Are you on tra track? Are you successful? Does it work? Is it effective? Does it perform according to what you hope for? So also a few steps for this. Identify your key resources and capabilities. At this point, you've done it over and over. Appraise the resources and capabilities according to strategic importance, relative strengths. Develop, develop your strategy implementation based on your key strengths, key weaknesses, um, your superfluous strengths and irrelevant factors. What this just means is now you're doing your SWOT analysis and you will get a lot of information. Prioritize. What are the most important strengths and those things that you can action on immediately? And what are the most important weaknesses, those things that you need to rectify inside your organization right now that might hinder you to implement your key strengths? And then build on that to see um, how your strategy can be, uh, can be implemented best, most cost effective and sustainable to reach your organizational aim and objectives. All mission and vision, hey? but we don't mi mix them. Mission, vision, aim, objectives. Just an example, um, you guys can look at that example uh, by yourself on the slides in your book. A visual dep uh, depiction of strengths and weaknesses provide a strong message. <laughs> Guys, I said to you also before that it's easy for us to just in our head organize and say, but these are our strengths, these are our weaknesses. But things change and sometimes we forget. It's best to write it down. And even if you think but it's good just to keep the information in your head, it's not necessarily not necessary to develop a document. Portray it visual. Put it in tables, tabulate it, put it out there that you can see it. Um, they should therefore be nurtured, used on a basis for building extending competitive advantages. Key weaknesses are areas that are uh, critical for future success. Therefore, it provides clues to identify resources and capabilities. I spoke about this uh, a, a bit earlier. Your, your SWOT analysis is a tool really to prioritize what to implement and how can you take those things outside and inside your organization that will hinder your strategic implementation success and turn that into opportunities and threats. Ooh, what does this mean? When you see this, it means it's almost time for me to stop lecturing you. I know, I know you will be so sad and missing me. Yeah, right. But let's summarize this chapter. Understanding the strategic values of resources and capabilities and the role of establishing competitive advantage is crucial to the internal analysis. Distinct capabilities from form a more lasting basis for strategic su successes but simply striving for a strong position in the industry. 
functional framework and the value chain were explored as useful frameworks, the roles of architecture, reputation, innovation and knowledge as key drivers of capabilities were also explored. Now if I look at this, we went fairly quickly through the slides. I don't know why is it, maybe because I'm delivering it via video and you're not interrupting with questions, but I think there might be time in your next lesson to do the following. I want you guys to go and look at the following five questions and you will need to go and write this out and submit to me during our next lesson. Um, explain the relationship between resource and capabilities, discuss the reasons of the importance of brand value from a resource-based perspective, explain the importance of knowledge in establishing comparative advantage, compare and contrast the functional and value chain approaches for the identification of organizational capabilities, and lastly, find an example of each dynamic capabilities of an organization of your choice. Two pages. That is enough writing. Your name, surname, student number and date. Write chapter 7. Please hand it to me personally during our next lesson. To recap a bigger picture, we've been busy with your internal, external environment. And now this slide is focusing on your internal environment. Both these environments are important for your test an exam and must be studied. Also, your internal and external environmental analysis is used within your assignment. That assignment date is 5 April, no extension given. Also, keep on imagining yourself in the business and in a real environment as a corporate strategic manager. All these things that's on the slides, your internal and external environmental analysis, how can you use it and apply it in the workplace? Have a lovely week and I see you guys soon. Till next time.